For centuries, the Shroud of Turin has become one of the most mysterious and controversial pieces of cloth on the face of the planet. And now, for the first time, experts have spent years recreating what they believe to be the mystery man under the Shroud. For nearly 700 years, a single piece of linen has stood at the crossroads of faith and reason. A fabric that seems ordinary, yet bears the image of a man as though scorched by light, as though imprinted by something beyond human hands. To some, it is history's greatest forgery. To others, it is the most sacred relic on Earth. The Shroud of Turin is this amazing relic. At bottom, it's a piece of cloth. It shows a very faint sort of image of a crucified man. And the crucified man calls us to remember Jesus' death and resurrection. But to the machines of our modern age, to artificial intelligence, it is a puzzle written not in theology, but in data. And when AI was turned upon the Shroud of Turin, it did not dismiss. It did not kneel. It revealed patterns, symmetries, geometries, impossibilities that no brush could paint, no chisel could carve, and no fraudster of the Middle Ages could have known. This is the mystery of the Shroud. This Christian holy relic is referred to as the Shroud of Turin. The cloth that shouldn't exist. It stretches 14 feet long, more than the height of two men, three and a half feet wide, woven in a herringbone twill so precise textile experts struggle to place it neatly in medieval Europe. And yet, lying across this cloth, as if resting between its folds, is the front and back of a man's body. All four of the Gospels mention that Jesus was taken down from the cross, he was wrapped in linen, and then his body was put in the tomb. A man scourged with lashings, crowned with wounds across his head, pierced through the wrists and feet, stabbed in the side where blood and water would have flowed. At the very center is the face, serene yet haunting, eyes closed, beard parted, hair falling across the shoulders, not drawn, not painted, not stitched, but hovering like a memory, as though the fibers themselves were touched by something more than touch. The earliest confirmed record of this cloth appears in 1354 in the small French town of Lyre, where it was displayed by a knight named Geoffroy de Charny and instantly drew pilgrims. Crowds came to kneel. Some called it miraculous, others accused fraud, and even bishops wrote in anger demanding it be hidden. But hidden it was not. The people came anyway, because whether real or false, the shroud had power. The fire that could not destroy. In 1532, Disaster struck when the chapel in Chambéry, where the shroud was kept, erupted in flame. The silver reliquary encasing the cloth grew so hot that molten silver dripped upon it, burning holes through its folds. When the reliquary was opened, smoke and ash poured out, and the shroud was blackened, seared, scarred. It should have been reduced to cinders, yet it survived marked with symmetrical burn lines running across its length like open wounds. Nuns repaired it carefully, patching the burns with cloth and stitching new fabric to preserve the old. And in doing so, the shroud itself became a symbol of endurance. It bore its own crucifixion in fire, and yet it remained. The photograph that changed everything. For centuries, the image on the shroud seemed faint and blurred visible only at close range, until in 1898, an amateur photographer named Secondo Pia was granted permission to take its picture. He set up his heavy camera, exposed the glass plates, and in the darkroom dipped one into solution. What appeared before him stunned not only Pia, but soon the world. The shroud, seen in photographic negative, was not faint at all, but detailed, clear, and striking. The negative revealed a positive face with eyes, nose, beard, and expression sharper than any medieval sketch. The cloth contained an image that no eye could see directly, 
but which photography could unveil. The discovery electrified believers and unsettled skeptics. Or if this was art, it was art using techniques centuries ahead of its time. In the 20th century brought science into the debate. Microscopes studied fibers, chemistry examined stains, and pollen grains embedded in the threads were traced to regions around Jerusalem, while blood tests hinted at hemoglobin, even DNA fragments. Forensic pathologists noted that the wounds and blood flows matched what would happen in an actual crucifixion, with blood not where artists usually painted it, but exactly where doctors expected it to be. Stranger still, the image rested only on the outermost fibrils of the threads, just microns deep, a shadow so delicate that scraping away a fraction of the fiber erased it. Not paint, not dye, but something like a scorch. When brightness was later analyzed by computers, another revelation emerged. The image contained 3D information, where the lighter the mark, the further the cloth was from the body, and the darker the mark, the closer, forming a perfect mapping of depth woven into linen. No painting, no photograph, no medieval trick has ever been able to reproduce this effect. The carbon dating shock. In 1988, the world waited for an answer as three laboratories, Oxford, Zurich, and Arizona, were given pieces of the shroud for radiocarbon dating, the ultimate test. When the results came, they seemed final. The fibers dated between 1260 and 1390, and scientists declared the shroud a medieval forgery. Headlines proclaimed the mystery solved, case closed. But almost immediately, cracks appeared in the verdict. Critics argued the tested sample came from a corner known to have been handled, patched, and rewoven after the fire. Could it truly represent the whole? Microscopic analysis suggested the threads in that area were chemically different from the rest, with dyes from repairs, centuries of human touch, and smoke from the fire all capable of skewing the dates. Stranger still, the radiocarbon results from the three labs did not agree cleanly, leaving statistical inconsistencies that haunted the data. What had been declared case closed was suddenly case reopened. The age of AI and then the digital age arrived, bringing artificial intelligence to study the shroud, not to worship, not to debunk, but to analyze. High-resolution images were scanned pixel by pixel, and neural networks learned its geometry, its patterns, its microscopic variations, uncovering what human eyes could not. The image was not random, but filled with ratios, symmetries, and proportions too precise to be accident. The face aligned with classical geometry, yet without any artist's hand. More astonishing still, I, I reconstructed the image in three dimensions with uncanny precision, revealing a human figure with depth and contour, not flat paint, but the echo of a body once present. Attempts to recreate the effect with lasers, chemicals, and heat all failed. They burned too deep, blurred the edges, and could not replicate the phenomenon. The shroud remained alone. AI also discovered that the blood-like stains and the image itself were not the same. Two separate processes, not one. The blood stains had soaked into the fibers, while the image hovered only on the surface, independent and yet together. Theories and questions. So what is it? A medieval hoax? But where are the tools? The second example, the replication. A natural phenomenon? But what natural process burns only the surface fibrils of linen in a perfect 3D mapping of a human body? A burst of radiation? A flash of light? Something beyond our current physics? Or is it what believers claim? The moment of resurrection itself? A burst of energy that seared a man's image into cloth? Science cannot say. Religion dares to believe. And AI only sharpens the paradox the shroud as mirror. Perhaps the mystery of the shroud lies not in the cloth, but in us. To the skeptic, it will always be forgery. To the believer, it will always be miracle. And to the scientist, it remains anomaly, a riddle yet unsolved. But to all, it is a mirror, a mirror of faith, of doubt, of the human longing to see, to touch, to know the divine. The shroud of Turin does not answer. It only waits. It has survived fire survived doubt, survived centuries, 
and it will survive us too. Perhaps when we are gone, it will still be there, quiet, patient, bearing the image of a man who suffered, who died, and, some believe, who rose again. The machines have looked, the scientists have tested, the faithful have prayed, and still the shroud endures. The final question is not what it is. The final question is, what do you see? As we step back from the mystery, one truth remains clear. The Shroud of Turin is more than linen and fibers. It is a story woven with threads of history, faith, science, and wonder. It has outlived kings, wars, fires, and laboratories, refusing to yield its final secret. Perhaps that is why it endures, not to give us certainty, but to challenge us with questions that reach beyond the material world. In the end, the Shroud is not just about proving or disproving. It is about the human search for meaning, the longing to touch eternity, and the mystery of a face that refuses to fade. Whether you see an ancient forgery, a scientific enigma, or the imprint of the divine, one thing is undeniable. The Shroud of Turin continues to speak in silence across the centuries.